for taking time for us for this interview about sure. Robin the Last Day. As I told you in advance, we have three parts of it, and first of all, I want to talk about the motivation for the film with you. Can you tell me something about Itzhak Robin, the importance of Robin for Israel and for the peace movement? I mean, I had, the, I would say, the privilege that when Rabin was negotiating with the Palestinians a bit more than 20 years ago, um, I went with him both to Washington and to Cairo, and I took part um, in these events, which were public, not obviously in all the negotiations, because some of them were private. But I uh, had a big impression of the sincerity of uh, Rabin's determination to try to reconcile this conflict. Uh, it's a long conflict. Uh, every side has very strong positions. Uh, but uh, for good, uh, many reasons, human reasons, um, Rabin understood that if Israel wants to stabilize its situation in the Middle East, it had to, find, to try to find uh, arrangement with the Palestinians. And I think that he was uh, very courageous. Uh, eventually he paid uh, with his life for this uh, project. So, uh, a few years ago, we decided, a group of friends, that we have to try and look again at the story of the assassination of the Prime Minister of Israel, of Yitzhak Rabin. And it was a long uh, process of uh, research and uh, documenting ourselves. We knew that it's an extremely sensitive issue because uh, some of the powers that outset Rabin are flirting with the power right now, so... We'll talk uh, about this later. So we knew that this is a very sensitive issue, so we wanted to document uh, the, everything that we, we do. And, and the film is actually uh, completely uh, fac uh, fact factual. Uh, everything that he said is in the film is documented. There are, there are about 180 do uh, documentaries about Robin. Why this film? What's different in this film? I mean, this is not for me to judge, you know. Um, I don't want a film critic to be unemployed, you know. Okay. But um, what was for you the motivation to do this film exactly in this way it is? No, I think that uh, this is a civil act, not just a cinematic act, like some of the films um, we did. We spoke before we started filming with the cameraman and the sound man who are students of uh, Nuri Aviv that we did a field diary um, in the early 80s. Um, so sometimes I think filmmakers, with all due respect to this profession, have to go and be a citizen, just simply a citizen, and look at the world around them and see what is their concern about the world and make a movie as a sort of reflection. I think that artists, good artists in all the generations, it's not only this period, they've done it. You know. People now, for instance, like to speak a lot about uh, the Guernica by Picasso. And I heard a lot of speeches about the beautiful colors and the uh, frame and uh, everything else, but they forget that uh, Picasso uh, did the painting of Guernica because of the Luftwaffe bombing of this uh, Basque village. And this was his reaction as a Spanish uh, citizen who loves his country but is concerned to do a painting. So each one, uh, the writers and throughout the generation, this film is done by a group of concerned citizens, I would say. So it's a really tough personal statement for you as well to make this film. I don't know if it's tough or not, it's necessary. We come to back to this later. Uh, I want to jump back to one point. You said you uh, were following Robin to Washington, to, uh, to the Oslo contracts. Uh, what was your position in this story? I just hope that since we are talking with the young filmmakers that you will not edit what I said in a, in a disconnected, so you should keep it in the integrity. Okay. So we go forward to the style of the film which I noticed some, some points.
for me, it was really impressive to see you mixing archive material and reenacted material. As an example, um, the setup scene when the dismantling of the Israeli settlements by the soldiers, and they have a fight between the soldiers and the Israeli settlers. Then you mix with, with origin material from these days, from TV. And there are many other examples in the film where you're mixing, doing the scene, jumping from the real to the reenactment. What was your opinion and your idea behind this, this, this technique? I think that we need some scenes are uh, only existing in, uh, in document, like the very big manifestation by Rabin himself, the demonstration for peace, where he was shot on the 4th of November, and also the very large anti-Rabin uh, demonstration just a month before in Jerusalem. So, of course, I don't want to start to recruit uh, the, the first demonstration had maybe 150,000 uh, uh, people be, uh, being you mean present. The riots for the Zionism by Benjamin Netanyahu. You mean this one? No, no. The the peace rally had, peace rally. had about 150,000. The other one had 50,000. It's a massive thing, and the power of the archives, the authenticity, is necessary. Some scenes we don't have the the cinematic record, like the consideration of the commission. So it's a fictional thing. The majority of the film is fictional, mm -hmm. but as I said, it's uh, based on facts. But when I see a particular scene, like the scene with the settlers, you had already the material from TV. Why you made some material up for it? We, we had some of it, not all of it. Okay, so it was like to closing the parts which you're missing from the Also, yeah. Um, also, I recognize you have very long short, uh, shots, like to the arrival at the hospital scene, it's a really long shot from the car to the, to the operation room, or uh, the integra integrations from the Shankar Commission. There are really long, long shots. Um, why, why is this shot? Because I think today we learn more to make hard cuts and make jumpings with the, with the camera and with the scene. I mean, this the the this is about. the problem of today, you know. It's a Speedy Gonzalez uh, generation, you know. But I think sometimes you learn much more when you construct a sequence shot, I mean a continuous shot without editing, because then in the subconscious of the viewer, the she or he feel that you don't cut out elements. So the montage sometimes is a handicap when it's done too aggressively. That's why a lot of what we see on the evening news in any television, doesn't matter if it's Israeli, Israeli, Palestinian, German, French, American, we know that it is uh, constructed. But when you see a sequence shot, you have a sense that everything that you have in this unit of time, this block of time, it's, you see it integrally, so it's, uh, it gives to the credibility of the moment. And my third point, which I recognized was um some parts of the movie really remember me to other movies like uh, John, uh, Oliver Stone's JFK, with like the music from Emmett Posnansky, which was amazing and thrilling. And some scenes, how you made it, how you cut it, were you inspired with, by films like that? Or where did you get it? For the I mean, I'm just an architect, you know, I never studied film, not even, a, I'm less uh, qualified than the nice people who are filming me. I never studied even one hour in a film school. And uh, a couple of years ago, I did a master class in Sao Paulo with a very good Iranian uh, director, Abbas Kerastami. We did it together. And the students asked me, the uh, film school the students asked me, what would be your advice? And I said, go and learn architecture. So I think sometimes it's very good to study one discipline and transpose it into another one and only learn what you need to learn. Otherwise, you repeat too many conventions. And I think that cinema is suffering from, of the overburden of uh, conventions of uh, cinema. So, uh, to go back to your question, uh, I saw other films, including uh, JFK. Uh, I think that the main decision that Oliver Stone which did, which is good, that he didn't try to, to cast uh, Kennedy by an actor, we did the same, you know. 
Uh, I think that other films which dealt with the killing of Kennedy who try to cast even Jackie Kennedy, that you feel immediately that it doesn't work because this figure like Rabin or Kennedy or, or any other, they have such strong aura that if, you, that if you start to mess around with uh, casting them, you already lose. Uh, I'm not uh, completely convinced by some other scenes, but uh, basically my references are not coming mostly from cinema. Uh, although there are some directors that I like a lot their work. So it's probably more coincidence that we have some refers to other... Oh, you, you think about another political assassination and you, you bring back some other films. Yeah? It's normal. Don't, don't feel uh, ashamed. You know? We come now to the assassination itself, because the message of the film... You had to take a long time for the research, I guess, because I read it in the press papers. You got some parts of the Schomburg Commission protocols, which were, weren't uh, readable so far for the society. After your whole research, what was actually the background of his murder? Who was the responsible figure? Because I found one interesting quote of Eldar, Adi Eldar, a major of the small town of Carmel and the follower of the, of the victim itself. He said that now the partner of the assassin, assassin ruled land. There was an idiotical figure who executed him. There was an idiotical figure who executed him, he said, but we must always remember that there are many other fingers next to the finger pulling the trigger, which are now his own power. Would you agree to this sentence? Yeah, I think it's a relevant question. How, how would you show that? How would you say that? You know, I think that when you do a film, I said it last night to the public, it's good to have the public as an interpreter, not as a consumer. I mean, this is the relation I like when I see a painting or, or I see a, or I read a book or I see a movie. So if the director overburdened the film with an indoctrinated message, uh, he loses me. So I like films which uh, provoke uh, thinking. So I'm not going to work against my movie. But when, when I read the most critics or most reviews about your film, I think we get all an idea about where is it going, which direction and... I didn't say that they are wrong. I'm just saying that that's their job and the job of the viewer. You know, it's not the job of the filmmaker to, to overdo it. You know, I think that that's, you weaken your own, your own point. I want to make it clear as well, because um, I think that's important. Does this mean that the current members of the Israeli government are complicity in the murder of Rabin? I mean, you know, I think I answered you. Hmm. I would say that Rabin's opponents on this day are today in power, so they got what they want. Yeah, but history is cyclical, you know. I mean, uh, human tragedies uh, happen, but it's not so deterministic. P people who think that at some point that they got everything and they won, they may lose everything in the next uh, step of history. Shakespeare uh, writes about it. And this country also knows about it. When you want something uh, too much and you, are, you think that you are very efficient in doing it, you may be deceived in the next step. So uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see how history evolves. There was one interesting question in the film. Really close at the beginning of the interview with Shimon Peres. Um, for this, I found something else from Edgar Carey, the Israeli writer. And he said that political associations usually fail, like Martin Luther King after he gets killed, the civil rights movement in America gets stronger, um, after the assassination of Lincoln, they didn't return to slavery. But here's something extraordinary, because the killer got exactly what he wanted. Today, the settlement movement in, in Israel is stronger, it's more powerful, and the conflict is far away from the solution, I guess. In your film, you say, you ask a question to Simon Paris, uh, how would Israel be today without the assassination of Rabin? 
would it be a more peaceful country? I think that if Rabin was not assassinated, it uh, we would have been. I asked question the Paris the question: Would Israel be closer to a peace? And he said the three times, yes, yes, yes. And I think he's right. I think that uh, uh, Rabin has a kind of uh, quality that I like in some uh, type of Israelis. Is is very direct. He, he has integrity, and I think this was respected throughout the Arab world. And uh, since you have to deal with advers adversaries, you have to get the uh, belief that what you mean, it's not just a spin of uh, television, but you actually mean it. You know, So he was trusted. And the proof is that when he was uh, shot, after he was shot in his funeral, it's the only moment that all the leaders of the Arab world uh, went to Jerusalem, not just to Tel Aviv, but to Jerusalem, which is almost, they've ne never been there. And so I think this was, uh, they all felt that this is a, a page has turned in the history and peace will be more difficult to reach. Do you see today a man in Israel like him? I think that this is one of the reasons that we did the film, because when we look at the current powers in Israel, we feel that the only alternative to them is a dead man. So we said, okay, let's, <coughs> let's bring back the memory of this uh, figure. Uh, memory is also strong. You know, we're sitting here in the Jewish Museum in Munich, and the Jews know that if there was no, they didn't believe in memory, they wouldn't still exist after so many thousands of years on this uh, planet. So it, memory has a meaning. Uh, the planet, in my opinion, is not only run by money and greed and machine guns, but also by ideas. And uh, art can diffuse ideas, so this is a good reason to make a movie. I think this question is a bit naive, but I really want to ask you. Do you believe on a peaceful solution in the Middle East in your lifetime? We have to believe in it, because what's the alternative? I mean, I, once in the film that both of you saw that I did with uh, Norita Viv, a uh, field diary, Journal de Campagne, we went to interview the, <coughs> the mayor of uh, Nablus, the Palestinian. And I asked him a similar question. I asked him, are you pessimistic or optimistic? So he said to me, Amos, it's too luxurious to be pessimistic. We cannot afford it. Because when you are in a bad situation, you have, you have to remain optimistic because this gives you energy to change. If you are pessimistic, what can you be? A nihilist, a decadent, and so on. So I think we have to remain optimistic even if the conditions look pretty bad. If you could change anything in Israel, just something, what would you do? No, I think Israel has to uh, be sincere with the Palestinians. It's also their country. They have to be generous with them. The conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, is not like the other conflicts of Israel with the uh, Syria, with other, other countries which have jets and tanks and all the gadgets. And uh, uh, we have to, to really make a real effort, seriously, to find uh, ways to find a way of coexisting. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome.